Welcome to The F Word, a podcast series that examines, excavates, unpicks and reframes forgiveness through the lives of others. I'm Marina Cantacasino, a journalist from London, founder of the Forgiveness Project charity, and I've built my career investigating how those who face the most complex and devastating things in life find a way through. Each episode, I'll be talking to a guest who's experienced something very difficult or traumatic in their life but who rather than respond with hate or bitterness has embraced what the very least considered forgiveness as a response to pain. My guest for this episode of the F Word podcast is Jill Hicks. Jill is an author, musician, artist and mother. She is currently living in Adelaide, Australia, but in 2005, Jill was living and working in England when suicide bombers attacked the London transport system. 52 people died that day, and many were severely injured, including Jill, who lost both her legs in the explosion. I first met Jill just a year or so after the attacks, because we happened to share a mutual friend, and because I'd heard that while she didn't forgive, she was keenly exploring peaceful solutions to violence, to help her come to terms with and heal from the trauma of what had happened. So, Jill, it's really so lovely to speak to you again after quite a while. I know you're in Adelaide, and it's at least two or three years since we last properly spoke, and I think it's 16 years since the London bombings so brutally catapulted your life into a very different direction. First, I want to ask you, Jill, how you're living your life now since being back in Australia for a few years. How do you spend your days? Well, first and foremost, I am a very proud mum to my beautiful daughter, Emily, who is now eight years old. I still can't believe where the time evaporates. So I'm doing school runs and there's class representative and go out with all the mums and talk mum things. And it's just really quite Quite a very different life than what I was leading when I was in London for, I think it was 26 years I lived in London. So a very, very different life here. But the one thing that I've actually really, I won't say enjoyed, but I felt sort of like a lifeline, if you like, to the tentacles out to my old life is all the work, thank goodness, on computers. So everyone that's now discovered Zoom during the pandemic, I just sort of feel very au fait with it all. Like, well, that's how my life is. You know, I spend my time looking at people on FaceTime or Skyping or Zooming. And I know you've recently won a prize for a really brilliant performance, which I saw live streamed from the Adelaide Fringe called Still Alive and Kicking, which is written and performed by you and tells your story, particularly focusing, I think, on the period of time you were in the pitch black bombed uh, tube deep underground in London. And it seems the resources you found in those moments, in the midst of that hell, somehow served you and allowed you to survive and create a new life. That was such a brilliant performance. I just was so moved and inspired by it. And I just wondered, why did you focus? It was so powerful. It really worked, by the way. But why did you focus so much on those minutes? I forget how many minutes it was. 20 minutes? An hour? I can't remember. But It was an hour. Yes. Yeah. Perhaps you could talk through why you use that. And also why that hour, Jill, was so pivotal to what happened next. Thanks, Marina. It's been something for the last 16 years that I think one of my many quests, if you like, has been trying to understand and really tease apart why I am not filled with hatred or bitterness or seeking revenge. And I say that from almost a sort of a third person view into my life, especially when being a double amputee. I still have many days, months that are absolutely overtaken by pain, by being completely incapacitated. So I have many trigger points that can catapult me back into a situation of feeling 
utter bitterness for my predicament, if you like, or the infliction. And I've just been really fascinated as to why haven't I gone there? Why am I still filled with such awe of who we are? So I've kept coming back to this hour that was literally the aftermath of the bombing. And what I experienced in that hour and the subsequent hours afterwards, the immediate rescue, I believe really has shaped my second life, if you like. And for all intents and purposes, I think that what I felt was a real deep sense of the power of human connection can literally move mountains. But I felt wrapped and shielded by almost like an extraordinary, unconditional love. And it was so powerful and so strong that I've actually spent probably most of the last 16 years trying to find ways of describing it, of being the messenger of that experience. Because for me, I want to be able to shout and scream and say, we are so much better than what we give ourselves credit for. And that I feel that I'm walking around on this earth with this great secret of, I know how our capacity to love and to heal can transform lives. I've witnessed it and I've been the recipient of it. I've been the recipient of it by literally someone holding my hand. And that first happened in the aftermath. So when it was the survivors and those who were very sadly coming to the end of their life, we were together. We had nothing but ourselves and this vast darkness. And I didn't know what had happened. I didn't know a bomb had just gone off. There was no sound. There was nothing. It was just suddenly we were all in this surreal new world. And I remember clearly, as if it was just yesterday, the instinct of survival was not only for oneself, but it was for us as a collective. That concern for the other was palpable. It was tangible. We were all reaching out for each other. And what particularly got to me, given that it was London, is that as commuters on the underground, we were conditioned. We followed the etiquette of you don't talk to anyone, you don't look at anyone, you don't interact. That's how you commute. And so to have had that etiquette ingrained and then something horrific has happened and our reaction is to reach out and help each other and hold on to each other. And in that holding, it was like both a hope and a reassurance and also a serenity, if I can use that word, because of course there was nothing remotely serene about the horror of that scene, but there was a serenity between us as people in the connection, in the holding on. And then all we could hear was each other's voices like a roll call, something that we did to help keep us awake, help keep us aware, help keep us together. Because essentially we were waiting for we didn't know what. I didn't know if anyone even knew we were down there, if anyone was alerted to the fact that something had happened. So we were just calling out our first names around and around and around. And I remember how important it was to hear the name that was always before mine, to know that that was my cue. And I had to be awake and present because I was listening for my cue in order to say my name. And that went on for an hour before rescue could reach us. And once you were rescued, you were taken to St. Thomas's Hospital. And I know you've spoken about your time there. And I think you even used the word euphoric about some of your experiences there, which might be quite hard to understand. Yes, to be alive, but the reality 
of your injuries must have hit so deep and been such a shock. I would have thought that would have wiped out any euphoria. Not at all. Isn't that crazy? You know, I, again, remember waking up not knowing what had happened. I couldn't speak for a long time and I'd lost a lot of my hearing. The only mechanism I had to communicate was through my eyes. And again, how amazing we are as a species that there was all these medical teams that knew exactly what I was trying to say through my eyes and they were responding back to me. And they didn't know if I could hear or not, but there was this real sense of I was understood and I was safe. And I remember feeling for my arms and that sort of sense of relief that my arms were here, I was okay, I was still Jill in my mind. And I did, I felt completely euphoric that I was still here and I knew that I'd lost both my legs and somehow I just felt that being me and still being here and alive was everything and that euphoria stayed pretty high for a long time it was actually seven years until I first discovered my bout of PTSD so it was completely unexpected and that was triggered through I'd lost my eyesight through a detached optic nerve and that was enough that was the trigger point for me to just say okay bad things can still happen I'm not immune and I went into a very shocked state of PTSD and quite heightened anxiety after that. I'd love you to say if you felt that was really important actually to go through that PTSD period after the seven years. But before that, I mean, I just remember the first time we spoke, you mentioned that on that day, on that morning when you took the tube, you had just thrown on a scarf. You never normally wear scarves, but for some reason you decided to wear a scarf that day. And that scarf, because you used it as a tourniquet, had probably saved your life because it had prevented the blood flowing. And I just remember you seeing that as great good fortune, whereas a lot of people, and I'm sure it would have been me, would have thought, what misfortune to have got on that carriage? Why did I leave the house at that time? And just wondered if it's part of your personality that you went straight to the thing that was going to buoy you up and give you hope and make you see it as you were meant to live. And that was a sign somehow. It's so difficult to answer this because I'm still very much in the mind of trying to explore exactly the question you've asked of the why. And I'm still there in believing that it was through my experience of feeling this wrapping of absolute love and intention I can't get past this very real situation where literally I was given an ID bracelet when I was taken to hospital that just said one unknown estimated female. That was a real moment for me, looking at this arm bracelet and realising that, of course, they didn't know who I was. I couldn't speak. I couldn't say my name. I was an unknown person. And my skin was completely burned. I looked at those words on that ID bracelet and thought, what state must my body have been in? And all of that, I think, has really culminated in me feeling even more deeply around the exception and the exceptional love that I was shown and given and experienced during my rescue and during those early days in hospital that really have been the turning point because I am then able to look at everything through a different lens of how fortunate am I, like you said, that I happened to wear a scarf that day, that I happen to have this presence of mind to even be able to tourniquet up the tops of my legs. I mean, I've never done a first aid course. Anyone that knew me, Marina, would absolutely say, no, 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 Jill would not be able to cope being in a situation like that. And I surprised myself. I surprised myself with how calm I was. I think we all did. As I said, I'm coming back to that 
description of a serenity, it wasn't the chaos that perhaps someone may think we were very collected, very gathered and very focused on what we all had to do, and that was to survive. And as you said, life one and life two, it seems you embraced this new identity with great vigour and enthusiasm even. Well, I felt it. I felt the privilege. I felt the honour. I remember being there in a hospital and thinking, okay, what is my purpose? What am I doing? Because I've got this new chance to have a life that I could never have imagined now being disabled, losing both legs. I could never have anticipated such a change of path. But I still felt what an honour it is to be alive and to feel. I can feel everything. I can feel the pain of my injuries. That's a signal that I'm alive. I can feel the joy of being here, of still having my mind. I had some horrific head injuries. And once the extent of my injuries started to unfold, I just felt, you've said it before, even more euphoria of how amazing it is that I'm actually here. Every day truly became not only just a bonus, but an opportunity of creation of how did I want to design this second life. But that was more than about your own survival, wasn't it? You were clearly also incredibly inspired and lifted by basically the kindness of strangers in the aftermath of the bomb. How was that for you? For me, I was one unknown estimated female. I can't get over the fact that these humble human beings that are the paramedics, that are British Transport Police, that are the Met Police, that are the tube workers, that they would choose to put the life and lives of one unknowns above their own safety and rush towards a scene where they had no idea whether there'd be a secondary device, whether the tunnel walls would collapse. All that was important was preserving and saving human life. And for me, that has been the greatest insight into who I know we are. It's just how do we live like that every day? So fast forward to, you know, seven years after the bombing, you said the PTSD kicked in at that point. Do you think that was an important experience to have? Had it been sort of buried and was it waiting to come out? Did you need to go into the rage and the anger and the despair and the depression? So when I was in hospital, I had three visits by the psych team. And I remember that on the third visit thinking, okay, they're really digging to try and find out why I'm so happy, you know. And I remember offering chocolates and I was sort of sitting there on my bed, you know, with bandages still around my stumps and saying, oh, would you like a chocolate? And thinking, what are they looking for? Why are they so bothered by me being happy? And I was trying to explain, look, I'm genuinely happy that I'm alive and I'm okay. So whether I had to go through something to really feel the depths of it, I don't know. I'd rather not have experienced PTSD. I still carry it to this day. The anxiety sometimes is overwhelming and completely debilitating. And they're things that I find are the only parts of my life I start to feel resentful of. So I feel resentful of any days where they've been lost to me having an overload of anxiety and not being able to do the things that I want to do. I'd like to just talk about the 19-year-old suicide bomber from the north of England, and I just wondered how much time you'd given to thinking about him. I suspect it's very difficult when the perpetrator kills himself because it means justice, whatever justice means in these circumstances, can never be served. And there's no one to hear from, no one to explain why they happen, no living person on whom to vent your anger. So I just wondered about your thoughts about this young man. We've had many conversations over the years around forgiveness and how I've struggled with the idea of what it is to forgive because I see him now perhaps more as a representation of something that challenges us as a society. 
rather than him as a person. So therefore, I've managed to navigate my feelings towards him, the person, and park any ideas of whether I forgive, whether I don't forgive, what's my relationship like with this. He's become this representation in my mind of someone that's been so susceptible to follow an idea so strongly that it's formed a set of ideas that's created an ideology that he was willing to die for, and not only willing to die for, but willing to kill others for. What a challenge for us all in society to even attempt to unravel that, to begin to understand why would somebody do this? You know, why would they feel so deeply about a supposed cause? I've got to be so careful because the one thing that I have taken myself of a lesson that perhaps I believe he could have taught me is to never presume anything about anyone you don't know. And if ever I think about him, I think about his presumption and how he was the only person in that carriage that morning that knew what was about to happen. And at any given time, when he caught any of our faces or even looked into any of our eyes, he could have had that moment of empathy. He could have had that moment of choice to say, what am I doing? These people don't deserve to die. I haven't asked them whether they're on my side or whether they're my enemy. I've presumed. I've always been so cautious since I've given him any deeper thought of his motivations and his actions. And the one thing I've taken is to never presume anything about anyone you don't know. So I try desperately to never do that. While forgiveness may not be on the table, Jill, what about not hating or feeling compassion or even empathy for someone who might have been drawn into violent extremism through having had their mind brainwashed or just believing things that would seem quite crazy and dangerous. I've spent probably 12 solid years working in the field of challenging destructive narratives and really trying to get under the skin of it all. And for me, I would say whilst I've parked the idea of forgiveness, it's not even a sense of compassion or empathy. For me, it's the willingness to understand. And I think that's where I would plant my flag that I would say I'm willing to sit at the table to understand. I think that's probably as far as I could go (laughs) with it because to me, there's no anger, there's no hatred, there's no bitterness. And I think they're already a great leap toward not just healing, but finding a way to eradicate destructive ideas turning into actions. I do believe that ideas are powerful, but I think we need to have better ideas to challenge ideas. I think we need to be far more challenging with each other as communities, as society, as humanity, rather than again coming back to this presumption of a black and white situation of I'm right, you're wrong. So for me, I'm always willing to offer a position of let me understand. And equally, whilst I'm listening to you, I also ask that you listen to me. Yeah. And I think understanding is absolutely critical. And it's really having a curious mind, isn't it? There's no doubt that people who commit heinous acts also are capable of doing great things, of loving, of being loved. Well, one of the great motivators of extremism is, of course, line or this thread of righteousness. And so it's not actually seen or felt as a criminal action. It's actually where in the right by believing this and by following and wanting to do these actions rather than we're criminals. I think when we look at 16 years on, to think that there's still this type of crime, then the pendulum that swings, that's then the rise of the alt-right and this cancer of hatred and 
indifference and otherness really is to the detriment of us evolving and growing, I think, as human beings. I know for several years after the bombing, you spoke publicly about the importance of countering violent extremism and about peace building, yeah, understanding, building bridges between people of difference. And you do less of that now. So I'm just wondering why did that take its toll on you? Was there an impact of talking too publicly about it? It did several things. I felt that the messages of peace are often met with people feeling uncomfortable. It's like when you mention the word love and, and I watch people sort of think, oh, she's not talking about love again, is she? Oh, I feel so uncomfortable about that. And it's the same with peace. You know, I mentioned the word peace and I'd watch people immediately turn off. And I just thought that and these are the people that you really want to impact because those who already have a natural desire for a world that comes together, I don't need to talk to them so much because they're there and they're working towards this. They practice that. But it's the people that turned off that, of course, you want to reach and did a TED talk that was then picked up by the American platform of TED. And they ended up having to turn off the comment section because it was just vile absolutely vile comments. And, you know, it does hurt. And it did leave me in a sense of despair of, well, what is it I have to do <laughs> to get this message out? Because it's definitely a message that is timeless. It's definitely one that needs to be heard, if not today, more than ever. So for me, I went deeply inside, back into my shell because I used to perhaps naively think that someone who had suffered some great trauma and tragedy, however they chose to talk about it, however they chose to heal, the public would respect it and be interested in it and perhaps even inspired by it. And yet it seems it almost encourages people to be even more venomous when it's someone like yourself, the injured, traumatised victim, talking about it. Do you know why that is exactly? I mean, I'm incredulous, really. What comforts me is the majority of people, of course, are absolutely writing to me saying, Jill, thank you, your words have changed my life or your actions have changed my life, thank you so much. And if I didn't have that type of encouragement and acknowledgement, I think it would be very difficult to keep going. But I have been puzzled by the negativity in I remember one comment stuck out to me. Someone said, oh, virtue signaling much. And I, <laughs> I had to go away and, and Google, what does virtue signaling actually mean? You know, and when I saw the meaning, I thought, oh, that's terrible. As if I'm preaching from the parapet of this is how you need to live and everyone needs to be these great humans. And I thought, that's not what I do at all. I'm actually very conscious to not do that, to not say to people, you must be great and you must <laughs> love each other. I, not at all. I think my message very clearly for me has continuously been everything we need, we already have. And however you want to interpret that is up to you. Maybe that's hard for people to imagine if they had had such horrific injuries, they'd want to lash out. And why haven't I lashed out? Maybe it's that anger and hate is on the rise. So when you have a message that cuts through that, perhaps it's very difficult for people to hear it and to believe it. But as I said, if it wasn't for the encouragement of the majority, I think I'd find it very, very difficult to continue. And you were saying before that because of all the negativity and because of the difficulty of this peace word, that you went back into your shell to think about how to get the message out. So I'm just wondering, what did you come up with and how are you living your life now? Wonderfully now living in such a picturesque nature spot in Adelaide in South Australia. And my go-to is the ocean and I just love to sit and stare at the ocean and somehow I get the answer to the questions I'm asking by just staring at this body of water. And for me, the answer came back of explore how you're talking, explore how you're communicating. Maybe you need to change the frequency, meaning the dial, the tone, the medium. 
So I went back to painting and my painting, which is something I did in life number one, my painting was completely different. Suddenly everything, the whole emphasis of every piece was about communicating the importance of us as a species together as a one humanity and to see each other not as the other but as a collective. I noticed with certainly some of your early paintings and the scarves that there was a bit of a black and white theme going on. Yes. And I wondered if that was intentional. Absolutely intentional. That was literally taken from me thinking about the bomber's very black and white mindset and how really a lot of us do live in that way of us and them. And I was just so eager to try and find a way of you know, where is the grey? Where is that in between? Where is that moment? I just couldn't do enough of this painting. And I thought, I oh, know, I need to make scarves. Again, coming back to this life saving scarf that I had on the morning of the bombing. For me, it was just a natural progression of I need the art to be on a scarf because I need people to wear these things to start conversation. And that way they can talk to the other by having art as almost the enabler to start the conversation. And that just progressed. And then I wonderfully found music again, again, reaching back to the tentacles of life one when I was a musician, an artist. And I thought, I need to go back to move forward in how I communicate. Hence, I sort of parked the not-for-profit that I had, which was Mad for Peace. I still loved the acronym of MAD. And I thought, what is MAD for me now? And it was so clear. It's music, it's art, and it's discussion. Is there a sort of restorative healing element of going into your imagination and being in the present? Oh, I can't even begin to explain it. It was like coming home in the most exceptional way, just that first moment of being back with a canvas, I'm lost in it. And it was just this moment that I can step away from feeling pain, from feeling that I'm having to balance on these prosthetic legs. There was none of it. It was just me, paintbrush and the canvas. And it was just flowing. And it was the same with coming back to music. Everything that I've seen you produce, whether it's your art, your music, your book, your public speaking, it has a tremendous effect and people come away, I think, often having had their fixed thinking changed and had that minds opened. So, Jill, I think we've covered a lot of ground. Thank you so much for talking to me today on the F Word podcast. It's just been such a joy to hear your voice all the way over there in Adelaide. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Marina, and wonderful to talk to you as always. Thank you for listening to the F Word podcast. To dig a bit deeper around some of the themes we've talked about, do check out the show notes by going to the forgivenessproject.com slash F Word podcast. And from there, you can also explore the Forgiveness Project website, which over the years has collected and shared many more stories of how people have transformed the darkest of situations. I also want to invite you to join the F Word podcast Facebook group, especially if you have more to discuss or share. Again, to find the link, go to theforgivenessproject.com slash F Word podcast. But most of all, I hope you'll join me again.